Well, welcome to this Garden Court webinar, um, Drill Music, Gangs and Prosecutions Challenging Racist, Racist Stereotypes in the Criminal Justice System, Part 3, Drill Music, Injunctions and Ancillary Orders. Uh, my name's um, Leslie Thomas. I'm a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and we're, you know, we're really pleased to welcome you to this um, third instalment of our lecture series on Drill Music. We've got Garden Court's Daniel Manson and Abigail Beish, alongside guest speakers, Dr. Adam Elliot Cooper and Cecilia Goodwin. And they're gonna consider how the law's being used to curtail the production and performance of drill. From a criminal behavior orders to civil injunctions, our panel will discuss the history, more impetus, practical consequences of the imposition of such orders, which are being used frequently by the state to su suppress and restrict freedom of expression of artists from the black community. Now, just a, uh, a couple of um, um, ground rules. You've all been placed on mute. Um, so please post your questions in the question and answer box window, which you'll see at the bottom of your screens. The chat function is enabled for any other comments, queries, and or feedback that you may have. But please don't post questions in the chat function. Use the Q&A. Resources will be circulated to registered delegates after the webinar. Please, um, this, please note that this webinar is being recorded. What that means is that the audio and video of the panelists and the speakers will be recorded. And this webinar may be shared on our marketing channels, including our website and social media. Um, we will do our best to assist with any technical issues. If you do have problems, please um, refer to the chat window for detailed instructions um, if you have a technical issue and a member of our Garden Court webinar team will assist you. So um, I want to um, introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Adam Elliott Cooper, Research Associate of the uh, University of Greenwich. Adam received his PhD from the School of Geography and Environment at, at the University of Oxford in 2016. He's previously worked as a researcher in the Department of Philosophy at UCL, as a teaching fellow in the Department of Sociology at the University of Warwick, and as a research associate in the Department of Geography at King's College London. He currently sits on the board of the Monitoring Group, an anti-racist organization challenging state racism and racial violence. Uh, Adam, over to you. Um, can you tell us, please, what you know, what you're going to be speaking about um, this evening? Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, uh, Leslie, and thanks so much for everyone at Garden Court Chambers who has uh, put this event and this series of uh, brilliant events together. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about, uh, the, I guess, the a cultural history of the policing of uh, black music and black cultural expression or uh, cultural expressions associated of black people and black communities. Uh, so it will be a, quite a brief, almost potted history, but I think it will give us a better idea of the kind of context in which we're uh, working with, with the current uh, problems being faced by uh, musicians and their families and communities who are involved in drill music. Uh, so I want to begin with um, uh, a black musical genre that we often maybe don't necessarily recognise to be a black musical genre. And that's the genre of rock and roll. And I'm going to quote from um, a great book called um, Hoodigan, A History of Respectable Fears by Geoffrey Pearson. Um, and he writes that um, in 1956, um, America unleashed a new monster, according to the Daily Mail, a sort of nightmare in rhythm. Rock and roll, often known as rock, roll and riot, is sexy music, said the Daily Mail. It can make the blood race and has something of the African tom-tom and voodoo dance. Describing this new music as a communicable disease and the music of delinquents, the Daily Mail ran a front page editorial on what it called rock and roll babies. It will pass, assured the writers, yet this sudden musical phenomenon has led to outbreaks of rowdyism. Along with rock films and trade union picket lines, rock and roll, the Daily Mail said, is a manifestation of the primitive herd instinct. It is deplorable, it is tribal, and it comes from America. It follows ragtime, blues, Dixie, 
jazz, the hot cha-cha, and the boogie woogie, which surely originated in the jungle. We sometimes wonder, pondered the Daily Mail, whether this is the Negro's revenge. So in the 1950s, we see that uh, rock and roll, people listening to rock and roll, dancing to rock and roll, um, enjoying its kind of cultural manifestations, was seen to be an imposition on the tranquil, uh, ethnically and culturally homogenous, uh, calm life of, uh, of Britain. The idea that Britain is a place with, where, where people have a stiff upper lip and they know moral and sexual restraint um, and they don't engage in excess or debauchery paints a picture of Britain as somewhere where, where the, any, anything which uh, shatters or disrupts this uh, imagination of tranquil Britain is something which has, must have come from abroad and often something which is black. This, um, concept, this idea, I guess, around um, rock and roll is part of what I think Stuart Hall and his colleagues called the moral panic. Uh, the moral panic was the idea that um, uh, was, a, I guess, a political uh, media and often police campaign around an idea that Britain is descending into moral degeneracy through a cultural or social phenomenon. And rock and roll was one of those in the 1950s. And I'm going to talk about how these categories of crime or moral degeneracy um, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s and leading up to the 21st century it can help us to better understand the moral panic around drill music today. So I guess key of the 1950s um, not, wasn't just music that, um, from the United States or black music from the United States that the newspapers um, and the politicians and of course eventually the police were concerned with. It was also black people migrating from Britain's colonies in the Caribbean um, and there was a great deal of concern in the 1950s uh, particularly around white women potentially being seduced by men migrating from Britain's colonies um, to Britain um, in the 1950s. Um, in fact in a vice squad was set up in Newcastle to police the alleged drugging of white girls by coloured men in parties, despite police and hospitals having zero reports of such incidents. Journalists assured readers that, quote, the only white women some young coloured lads are likely to get near enough to desire are those women quaintly called undesirable. Tainted by the proximity to blackness, White women suspects of attending black parties or dancing to black music or having relationships with black men were the target of both contempt by the British press and some politicians. Investigative reporters across the country posing the question, your daughter marry a black man? Giving rise to concerns about what neighbours might think, how coloured offspring might be dealt with, and importantly, how the honour of the white man's father might be tarnished by such relations. Miscegenation, therefore, threatening the sanctity of the respectable British home and the prospect of black culture and sexuality interfering with the order and civility of, of traditional family value. The key concern of both governments and press and popular culture in Britain in the 1950s and 60s. One of the most notorious places of black culture and therefore, of course, moral degeneracy was the Mangrove Restaurant in Notting Hill. By the late 1960s, it had become a fashionable establishment frequented by black radicals and celebrities, and of course, ordinary members of, of um, multicultural West London. The restaurant, nick nicknamed a resting place in Babylon, for its association of black power politics and the Caribbean community, did not go unnoticed, of course, by London's Metropolitan Police. The mangrove was under constant police surveillance and was regularly the subject of raids where staff were accused of serving food and drink illegally perhaps after hours, and customers were often accused of uh, smoking criminalised substances. It's, it's worth mentioning that proof of drug deals were never found on the premises of the mangrove, and Scotland Yard admitted themselves that the first raid was not based on any intelligence, but just purely suspicion, and past raids were used as a grounds for further suspicion and future raids. 
In response, a group of long-standing mangrove frequenters organised an action group for the defence of the mangrove to provide legal defence for local black people accused of breaking the law and called for the officers who instigated the raids and arrests to be sacked. The owner of the mangrove wanted to pursue institutional solutions to the problem through speaking to local MPs and through the courts. But the action group insisted he turn to the community in organising a collective form of self-defence. The approach of the action group, I guess, is maybe unsurprising as they understood racism as an injustice reproduced by state institutions such as the police, rather simply being the bigotry of individual police officers which needed a slap on the wrist or maybe mildly something worse. By organising independently of straight structures, the action group's intent was to confront the state directly. The grassroots in initiative culminated in a picket outside the mangrove in, in August 1970. About 500 officers turned up, including Special Branch and CID, and they policed the demonstration of fewer than 200 activists, many of whom had also been under close police surveillance. The police formed barriers blocking the march, confronting the demonstrators head on, and this inevitably led to pushing, scuffles, and eventually a, a confrontation. Nine arrests were made, with demonstrators charged with a range of, range of offences, including inciting a riot and assault on the police, or police officers. The accused became known as the Mangrove Nine, and their case was politically charged from the outset. But we, I think we have to remember that this was the defense of a black culture institution, and its criminalization is fundamentally linked with the idea that black culture and its institutions are, are hotbeds of criminality and violence and moral degeneracy. And it's this combination, this, this uh, linking between um, black culture and criminality, which is fundamentally, I think, important for understanding the wider context of the criminalization of drill. Over double the number of protesters actually, who turned up on the original demonstration outside the mangrove then came to support the mangrove night. And its prosecution rested on testimony from four officers claiming to have simultaneously watched through a single narrow observation window from inside their police van, dark as hell, the highest profile defendant in sight of riot. It was put that the officers each had one eye peering out at the demonstrators through this narrow slit in the police van. Darkest Howe's response was, of course, well, where was the rest of your, spa your face? Exposing the absurdity of such a claim and the fabrication presented by the prosecution. Three of the Mangrove Nine, def nine defended themselves in courts, drawing attention not only to the irregularities in the cases against them, but to the racist approach of the British state towards cultural institutions like the Mangrove. The activists illustrated how the violence of the police and the criminalization of black people were tactics common in colonies such as the Caribbean, but they were now being transposed to the mother country. All nine were acquitted of the most senior, serious charges of inciting a riots, and four were found guilty of assault and given suspended sentences. The victory of the Mangrove Nine generated renewed energy and confidence, I think, in Britain's black power movements and in the strength of its cultural institutions. And Notting Hill Carnival was established just a few years later, and this became an even more important focal point, not only for black culture, but racism and resistance to it. Now, while the Notting Hill Carnival started off as quite small, it really began to grow in 1975, uh, where uh, over half a million people attended the events. Uh, here, Dr. Cecil Gutsmort's research is particularly useful in understanding the context and the way in which uh, uh, the police and the local council responded to this growth of a new uh, Caribbean cultural event. Um, so while uh, even conservatives uh, described it as, quote, a colourful and happy event enjoyed by a lot of people and a good influence of race relations in the area, nonetheless, the carnival had to go. It couldn't remain on the streets of Notting Hill um, and it instead should be uh, moved to either uh, Chelsea football ground or to uh, the local Wormwood scrubs. The carnival was said to have become the victim of its own success and had become, quote, a field day for every wide boy and huckster, and was therefore disruptive of local community life. Uh, the Metropolitan and Police uh, supported this, as did the Home Office, um, and they said that if the proposals were rejected to move the carnival from the streets uh, to a football stadium or somewhere more contained, then the policing of that carnival would be drastically increased. And as I'm sure many people watching this are aware, uh, the latter is what took place. Carnival still took place on the streets and the police massively increased uh, the manner in which they sought to control and coerce it. 
So for each group of musicians, floats or bands that attended carnival, they, would be, they were surrounded by at least a, a team of at least 25 officers. Police cracked down on the sale of food and drinks without license, uh, can, small amounts of cannabis possession and suspected pickpockets. Police brought roadblocks, barricades and other equipments to determine the routes and limits of the carnival. And to give you guys an idea, um, uh, by in the year before there were simply there were just 80 officers attending carnival and there were over uh, over 200 uh, between 200 and 300 um, uh, by 1976. The Metropolis Police staged a series of raids on all centres of entertainment um, on day one of the 1976 carnival uh, with stall holders arrested for obstructing the highway, the sellers alcohol were arrested or, or reported, um, and there were raids on homes and uh, businesses, including that of the mangrove. By 1977, a year later, the police were being issued with riot shields and other um, uh, paramilitary equipment, generally reserved to mass disorder um, or the troubles in Northern Ireland. And it's of course these three carnivals that we saw the most significant instances of civil unrest. We saw people um, uh, responding to the arrests, the raids, the harassments, the searches, the indignities um, with civil unrest and revolt, which then spurred on the moral panic that this uh, popular culture, this movement of soca music and dub and reggae was in fact um, a, a thinly veiled attempt to engage in criminality, in debauchery and, and immorality, and of course violence against uh, the local community and the police. Today, of course, uh, the policing of Carnival continues um, with unconnected raids in the run-up to Carnival. You often see, if, you, uh, if you're unlucky enough to read the Metro newspaper or the Evening Standard, you will see raids from, uh, uh, t uh, for, for guns and for crack cocaine and for heroin uh, taking place in the run-up to the Notting Hill Carnival. And of course, the trialling of police technologies, including knife arches and facial recognition cameras, uh, have, have been popular as well. Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit now about uh, pirate radio um, in, in, the, in the last couple of minutes um, and, and Form 696, so which was used for grime music. Uh, so black music wasn't really taken very seriously in the 1970s and 80s from British radio. Um, reggae was seen as a bit of a joke um, and a non-genre, particularly before uh, the emergence of Bob Marley. Um, but as reggae gained some popularity, um, other black uh, genres of music, soul and funk from the US, soca, calypso, dub, um, from the Caribbean, Afrobeats from West Africa, or later rare groove, R&B, hip hop, and eventually jungle and garage, meant that in order for uh, black communities to be able to enjoy and listen to the music that they wanted to, um, they had to engage in, um, they had to use, listen, tune in to pirate radio stations, radio stations which were unable to uh, be awarded uh, a license due to financial constraints or, or other kinds of uh, regulations on uh, British radio. And so, Unsurprisingly, this led to uh, the criminalization of the people who were engaged in, this, um, in, in, these, in these radio stations, whether they were shut down or had their stations um, uh, raided. Um, and of course, by the time we get to the early 2000s, we see uh, jungle music and garage music gaining popularity. And for many of these pirate radio stations, which actually uh, unironically began um, on, uh, on boats, um, around the British Isles were of course at the top of council estates and these already criminalised um, communities were, uh, were being further uh, criminalised and seen as, seen as places of moral, moral degeneracy um, uh, due to these uh, pirate radio stations uh, being used. So finally, um, in the 2000s, we have things like Form 696, uh, where, it's, again, it's presumed that race and culture have a causal link uh, with criminality um, and we see the police uh, delivering these forms to music venues all over the country in order to attempt for them to um, get an idea of where black people are going to be uh, frequenting. And while this was scrapped with no apology in 2017, um, and the government uh, said that it was scrapped generally because of its effect on the nighttime economy rather than its discriminatory nature, and the police said it was scrapped to, due to a reduction in, the, in serious events in music establishments, I think we have to again understand this as part of a longer history of the criminalization of black cultural life in this country. So I want to close by very briefly saying that what the, asking what these moral panics serve right? it isn't simply racism for racism's sake. Um, I would say that these these moral panics create the impression that Britain is in a crisis, a cultural crisis, a moral crisis, a racial crisis. And one of the reasons these kinds of crises have to be invented or at the very least um, uh, uh, 
uh, expanded or uh, uh, have the impression created that they're far more pronounced and, and terrible than they are, is because this country is often through these moments going through an economic crisis, a crisis of political legitimacy, and currently a health crisis and a looming environmental crisis. And by create, so by manufacturing new crises, different crises, the government can create the impression that it's dealing with the problems that the country is facing, rather than simply uh, creating new crises for it to deal with and hiding the ones that it really needs to um, uh, tackle if we're going to address the economic problems, the political problems, and the health and environmental problems that really underpin the most um, uh, the problems faced by the most marginalised people in this society. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Adam. That was that was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I, I did say at the very beginning that if anybody has um, any questions, they can put the questions in the um, um, Q and A box at the bottom. Um, and what we can do is we can either take questions immediately after a speaker, but there will be time at the very end for us to take questions as well. So, um, you know, leave your questions at the bottom if you want a particular speaker to answer question just you know indicate that in your question and we'll, we'll arrange that all right um I, I i want to now turn to our uh, our second speaker daniel manson is a barrister at garden court chambers daniel joined chambers in march uh, of this year and is an experienced um practitioner defending individuals charged with the most serious offense of offenses the supply and production of drugs firearm offenses she has particular expertise representing children and young people and is also a member of Justice uh, Racial Disparity in the Youth Justice System Working Party. More recently, Danielle has been representing those who've been charged with criminal offences arising out of the protests, including, but not limited to, the Extinction Rebellion uprisings and the Stop the Arms Fair campaign. Danielle is also a committed member of the newly formed grassroots organisation Black Protest Legal Support, which was formed in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement following the death of George Floyd. And she's been responsible for training and coordinating um, over 100 barristers and solicitors as legal observers. So Danielle, um, over to you. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about? Hi Leslie, um, thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, um, I'm just going to attempt to um, share my screen as well because I've got some um, I've got some slides that I'd like to use. So just bear with me. Just make this full size. Can everyone see that? Great. Okay. Um, so, as um, as everyone will be aware, the title of this series um, is Ancillary Orders, and we're looking um, following on from what was um, spoken about last week at um, what happens to defendants who have been convicted or pleaded guilty um, at, at the end of criminal proceedings and, and, and what, what, what sort of orders um, are available um, to, to the courts. I'm going to be specifically looking um, at, at criminal behaviour orders um, and I know that um, Abby's going to talk a little bit about some, um, some civil orders as well that are slightly different. Um, but um, really what I wanted to start by saying about the criminal behaviour orders it is firstly that they are um, ancillary orders that are available um, across a range of offences. So CBOs are used in, um, in fraud cases, um, in hate crimes and um, where there's been domestic violence, etc. So it's not just limited to the sorts of offences you would associate um, gang members or, or drill artists to have committed. Um, and and, and second, secondly, um, if we look at the legislation, which I'm going to go on to do, um, if you take a literal reading of the legislation, it's clear to me anyway that, that the vast majority of cases that are before the criminal courts um, would satisfy the re requirement for the imposition of a criminal behaviour order. And um, so it, it, it's quite broad. Um, 
it's quite broad the power that has been conferred um, upon the courts but there is case law that I'll also go on to, to talk to you about um, and the Court of Appeal have, have really made clear that applications for criminal behaviour orders should only be made for the most serious and persistent offenders and that there should be a proper degree of caution um, with regards to um, any application so not just in relation to applications that concern um, the production and performance of drill music, but more broadly um, uh, uh, across, across the range of offences that, that, that the courts will hear. Um, I've also just put on the screen there, just a, a quote by Jodie Binsberg, who was the chief executive of the Index on Censorship, um, that really goes to the heart of what I want to talk about in relation to these orders, um, namely that the imposition of an ancillary order following a criminal conviction isn't going to address the issues that, 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 that lead to the creation um, of, of this sort of music, nor should we really um, be, in my opinion, um, setting dangerous precedents where we're um, censoring art forms. Um, but a, a, a brief potted history um, of, of criminal behaviour orders, um, they came into force in October um, 2014 following um, Home Office consultation. Um, they, they replaced antisocial behaviour orders, which were civil um, orders that, that, that were imposed in the civil courts. Um, and the key difference really between um, the criminal behaviour order and the antisocial behaviour order um, is twofold. Firstly, um, with a criminal behaviour order, there is um, the permissibility of imposing mandatory requirements. So under the old ASBO regime, an individual could only be precluded from doing something, but under the CBO um, legislation, individuals can be required to do something. And that's particularly relevant when we look at um, the imposition of CBOs for, for drill artists, because there are mandatory requirements, for example, that drill artists have to um, report to the police any new music that, that, that they're making or any new music video in, in which they're going to feature. Um, so, the legislative framework, section 22 of the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act, um, and as you can see, um, the power to make an order. Um, an order, a criminal behaviour order, has to be attached to um, a, a conviction, um, and there are two conditions that, that have to be met. And the first, that the court is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt the offender has engaged in behaviour that caused or was likely to cause harassment, alarm or distress. And the second condition is that the court considers that the making of the order will help in preventing the offender from engaging in such behaviour. And this second condition is one of the um, other differences between criminal behaviour orders and antisocial behaviour orders. Um, antisocial behaviour orders, the test was whether or not the order was necessary. But clearly, as we move towards criminal behaviour orders, the test is just one of helpfulness, which I see obviously as, as a watering down um, of the requirements to impose these orders. Um, so just, uh, I'll just whiz through a, a, a few general principles that, that, that you can take from um, criminal behaviour orders. Um, as I've already said, they must be attached to a, a conviction um, and it must be on an application from the prosecution. So there's no power for the court to just make a CBO um, of its own volition. Um, CBO is not available in every case, so if um, an individual is sentenced to a bind over or an absolute discharge, CBO um, can't be imposed. Um, the courts have continually gone on to um, impress um, on the importance of any application and complying with the criminal procedure rules, and so it's not something that can really just be made on the hoof by the prosecution, um, and, and that as, as the next point states, um, even though the determination of an application for a CBO can take place after an individual has been sentenced, the application has to be made um, before the sentence. So it's not something that, 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 that can come along after an individual has been dealt with by the court. It's really something that the Crown have to put a bit of thought into. Um, admissibility of evidence in support of a CBO application, well, that can contain hearsay, bad character, etc. So it won't be the same um, as, as evidence that, that, that has been in criminal proceedings. If, for example, something was inadmissible in criminal proceedings, it may well be that 
that that same evidence is admissible for the purpose of a, a criminal behaviour order application. Um, and also, there's no requirement that there is um, a nexus between the criminal behaviour which leads to the conviction um, and the harassment, alarm or distress that has to be evidenced in order to, um, in order to impose the criminal behaviour order. So a CBO could be attached to a simple case of, of possession of, of cannabis if the prosecution are able to demonstrate to the criminal standard that the individual has engaged in other, um, other behaviour which has caused harassment, alarm or distress. Um, which is something I don't think everyone is aware of. Um, breaching a, a criminal behaviour order is a criminal offence and the maximum sentence for that is six months. Um, and, and examples of standard requirements for a CBO um, are sort of non-association um, with, with, with particular named individuals, ex exclusion zones, so individuals not being permitted to enter a postcode, um, and then restrictions on the use of social media um, and or the possession um, uh, of mobile phones. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to whiz through because um, actually what I'm really interested in is hearing how um, these orders are, are, are affecting people in practical terms. And I know that that's what Cecilia is going to talk about. But um, just because I think it's helpful just to put it into context, I've just put on the screen a few um, cases that are um, helpful and provide a, a little bit of background into how the criminal behaviour orders are being treated by the courts. Um, so back in 2016 when the orders were, 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 were relatively new, the um, case of R and Brown and Morgan established that the court doesn't have to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that making the order would help. So threshold isn't, isn't as high. Um, and also, um, as the case of Bulmer evidence, all the previous um, case law on antisocial behaviour orders translate and apply to criminal behaviour orders too. Um, the case of Khan in 2018 was also quite helpful because it just provided um, uh, some general guidance on, um, on criminal behaviour orders. And I've just highlighted the, 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 the pertinent paragraphs here. So. Paragraph 13, we emphasise the importance of complying with the criminal procedure rules. Um, paragraph 14, reaffirmed the principles of the case of Bowness that um, the terms of the order must be precise and capable of being understood. Um, and then par paragraph 20, which is, is quite interesting. Um, we do not believe that it was the intention of Parliament that criminal behaviour orders should become a mere matter of box ticket, of box ticket, box ticking routine. Um, as Beats and LJ Jay said, such orders are not to be lightly imposed and the court should proceed with a proper degree of caution, um, etc. And so that's really um, the court saying we need to just take a, a, a step back in relation to these orders and they shouldn't ju just be commonplace um, and be um, being ordered in, in, in every single case. Um, this year we've had a couple more cases that, that that deal with um, criminal behaviour orders. Um, and the case of Tofagazan, I hope I pronounced that right, um, basically uh, emphasises that where there are requirements, um, a, a criminal behaviour order must specify who's responsible for, for, for supervising compliance with that and that there must be evidence before the court about the suitability and enforceability of that requirement. And that's obviously an important safeguard to ensure that, that any requirement imposed is suitable and enforceable. Um, and then um, one of the last cases I'm going to look at, the case of um, Michael Roger Bryan. And um, this was a, a case in relation to um, an individual who had been um, fraudulently luring women into, um, into giving him money effectively. He, he was charged with a number of fraud, um, fraud offences. Um, but what the court said at paragraph 41 is that as a matter of principle, prohibitions should not be imposed in relation to conduct which would constitute a criminal offence on its own merits. And I'm going to come back to that point a little bit later because I think that's particularly relevant when we're looking at the reason the Crown say they are imposing criminal behaviour orders in relation to drill. Um, 
when I was researching um, this, this seminar, I, I watched a really interesting YouTube clip that talked about um, the use of CBOs as being a, a, a drill purge, a purge on drill. And really the first case of significance um, where a criminal behavior order was used um, to curtail the rights of, of artists performing drill um, was back in 2018 at Kingston Crown Court and there we had five defendants who were all part of um, a group called 1011 um, and they were all convicted of conspiracy to commit violent disorder. Um, they were um, handed um, criminal behaviour orders um, and they had a, a, a long list of requirements as part of the order. So we had non-association um, which included um, individuals of, of that music group. So they were told effectively, you can't associate with someone you're, you're, you're part of a music group with. Um, or if they did want to associate with them, it was only for the purpose of recording or performing music. And in that case, they needed to get permission from the police. Um, but the order went further than that. And there were prohibitions put on what could or couldn't be said on social media as part of songs and in videos or live performances. So references to individuals, they were told they couldn't say people's names, certain postcodes, um, you know, the Harrow Road, they weren't allowed to, to, to talk about. Um, there was an outright restriction on, on them performing seven songs that had already been released. Um, and the basis for that was that the lyrics were said to incite or encourage violence. Um, very interesting hearing what Adam was saying about the policing of the Notting Hill Carnival as well, because all these individuals were banned on attending the carnival. Um, and also that, that, that they had to notify the police of the release of any new official music videos in which they feature. Presumably that's so the police could, um, could watch them and censor them and, and take the necessary steps, depending on what their view, i.e. the police's view of, of those videos were. Um, now, I'm almost um, finished with, with really my, my brief overview of what criminal behaviour orders um, are and, and how they have been used um, to, to sort of police drill thus far. But what I really wanted to do before I finish um, is to just give you a, a, a brief example of, of, of the reality of, of these orders. So 1011, who I've just been talking about, um, tweeted, um, they didn't tweet, sorry, they, they, they rapped quite extensively um, about an individual called Tiwiz who, who was um, very sadly murdered in 2017. Now members of 1011 weren't suspects in, in, the, in that case, they, they, they weren't charged with the murder of him. Um, but what they did do is they commented and they ran commentary on, on that murder. And I've put here one of the lyrics from one of their songs, Play for the Pagans. And that was one of the songs that they were prohibited, one of the seven songs that they were prohibited from performing. And here they say, T. Wiz got splashed and died. I don't feel sorry for his mum. And that was one of the more um, shocking, I would say, lyrics that, 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 that was contained within their music. And it's often talked about, um, you know, perhaps people may think that's distasteful, um, obviously not, not, not sympathetic at all. But, you know, many of us for years now have been exposed to comments by individuals such as, such as Katie Hopkins, who um, used her social media platforms and indeed her role as a presenter on the radio for years and years and years to spread very um, similar, distasteful, um, unsympathetic um, points and so I, I, I've just put a couple of quotes from her you know back in 2015 so five years ago on Twitter she said dementia sufferers should not be blocking beds what is the point of life when you no longer know you are living it and then again on one of her um, radio shows on LBC in 2015 um, very very um, soon after 900 migrants drowned um, she was suggesting that we should burn all the boats um, and really i just put those I, I put those out there just for us to think about what adam was saying earlier about the over policing of the black community um, and also why there seems to be this this purge on drill um, and this focus and this moral panic um, around it when we've got middle class white women who, who who are saying equally unsavory and shocking comments yet it takes five years more than five years for her to have her twitter platform removed um, obviously the, the the use of criminal behavior orders to curtail 
um, the creation and performance of, of drill music um, will be um, infringing Article 10 of the Human Rights Act. I don't believe there's been any litigation in relation to that, but it will be very interesting in the future to see where that goes and what the court says about such arguments. And then just finally, my last point, um, I, um, I referred to the case of Michael Roger Bryan earlier, and obviously the court have said as a, as a matter of principle that prohibitions shouldn't be part of criminal behaviour orders in relation to conduct that would constitute a criminal offence on its own merit. Well, if the Crown's um, justification for prohibiting the performance of certain songs is because they're so violent they can properly be said to incite violence, then that would really and should be charged as a separate criminal offence. The Crown shouldn't be, in my opinion, um, being lazy and, and curtailing freedom of expression and, and performance of, of music, which is ultimately an art form, um, through these ancillary orders. Um, if they think the threshold has been met, then they should charge the offence. Um, but that's it from me, really, um, in, in relation to, to criminal behaviour orders. And I know we're going to have um, some, some more um, from the other two speakers. So um, that's it from me, oh, Leslie. Oh, thank, thanks, Daniel. Um, that was really interesting. Again, I, I mean, see, I just find it really shocking that the state um, can have such powers of censorship, because that's effectively what it is. It's, uh, it, it, it comes down, in, certainly into my mind, of censorship of, um, you know, um, culture and music. You don't like, no matter how distasteful um, you, you find it. And, and the problem is, um, you know, who, who gets to decide, um, you know, who gets to decide what, uh, how the censorship should go. Anyway, um, um, can I, can I just um, bring Adam back in for a moment? Because as Danielle was speaking, there was a comment that was posted. And I just, uh, uh, Adam, you might as well deal with it now. And, it, and the comment reads as follows. I think Adam makes a good point about the criminalization of black culture. But drill is literally used by members of gangs to goad rivals, explaining the concerns of people uh, explain the concern people have with the music. Uh, class probably best explains why people join gangs, but drill music can exacerbate these conflicts. Is this a fair point? Do you want to, do you want to just deal with that, um, Adam, and then we'll bring... Um, well, I'll, 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 be as, I'll be as brief as I can. I think the first point is that, um, and I think this is something that Daniel, a point that Danielle made, that if, there, if a criminal offence has been made, i.e. if people have been inciting violence, which I think is... Um, uh, uh, yeah, one of the main crimes. Then that should be the that should be uh, what people are charged with. But that's not what's taking place. People aren't reaching the threshold for inciting violence, and the law exists for I think, I think a specific reason, so that inc because inciting violence can lead to violence take actual violence taking place. And therefore, if they do not reach the threshold, they should not be um, uh, charged with offence which effectively amounts to inciting violence. Um, I think the idea that um, uh, that, that therefore people who are not inciting violence, but therefore can be considered to be goading um, other individuals, I think also speaks to some of the points that Danielle was making, which is the fact that um, people like Casey Hopkins goad the government into allowing migrants to drown in the Mediterranean. They goad the government into incarcerating and criminalizing people who are undocumented. They goad the government into engaging in forms of violence, forms of coercion, forms of perishable death for people who are undocumented. Yet we are not, these are not considered to be criminal acts in the same way as young black men on, in, 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 working class, in working class areas um, of the United Kingdom. Um, class, um, I don't know if class necessarily, best, I, I think you know, the whole question around gangs is also um, a, a very fraught uh, topic, which I don't have time to go into now. And I think the idea that the police is often the police who decide who is and who isn't a gang, and the definition of a gang is so vague and malleable that it can be used in ways which are more often than not discriminatory. And so I think we should be careful about, around this term as well. Um, but I think it's important, I think Daniel's, I think answer to those questions in, 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 in uh, more clearly than I really can in, in the way in which the law and uh, these police powers are being used very, very selectively um, in ways that I think are 
just not only discriminatory but generally unhelpful in reducing the very real problem of serious youth violence. All right, well, uh, thanks for that, um, uh, Adam. Look, let, let's um, come on to our next speaker, Abigail Beish, Barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Abigail is an experienced criminal advocate with a busy and varied practice in criminal law. She has defended cases of murder, rape, serious violence, conspiracy to supply firearms, conspiracy to rob, and serious drug offences. She's also had great success in um, resulting confiscation cases. Abigail has also had a significant amount of experience and expertise representing defendants with learning difficulties and mental health problems. Abigail, over to you. Um, what are you going to talk about? Thank you very much. I'm going to be discussing civil gang injunctions and actually some of what was just raised um, in that question I think will be covered um, by what I'm going to be discussing. Um, I'm just going to share my screen first of all. I'm conscious that we are overrunning a little but I think we will still have time to um, have at least 15 minutes of questions at the end, Cecilia, just so that you're aware and if I just get this up now. Good. Hopefully you should all be able to see that, can you? Yes. Right, um, so uh, civil injunctions. Now these started life um, much like the criminal behavior orders um, under Section 1 of the Crime Disorder Act as um, ASBOs. And uh, as you've just heard from Danielle, these are, um, those were made where a person had acted in a manner that was likely to cause or had caused um, harassment, alarm or distress. Now that's a positive act, something they had to have done. And the act itself is in fact a criminal offense um, under the Public Order Act. So the second condition was that it was necessary to protect other persons, to protect other persons from antisocial acts um, by, um, by them. Now, that quasi civil criminal nature of these, because they were standalone orders, you didn't need to have them attached to a criminal sentence like criminal behavior orders. Um, that was challenged then in the case of uh, McCann, um, looking at whether or not these were in fact civil or criminal. The relevance of that and the importance of it is that anything that's criminal has certain safeguards attached to it, sort of Article 6 safeguards. So that was looked at in McCann. And it was decided that they were civil in, the, in that they could have hearsay evidence admitted and relied upon. Um, they were criminal in that the first condition had to be proved to a criminal standard. So the criminal offence, the act had the usual safeguards of being proven to the criminal standard, which was then beyond reasonable doubt. But then again, back to civil for the second um, test, which was whether or not the necessity of it had been proved. That would be done on the balance of probabilities. That wouldn't be done to the criminal standard. Um, so that was an important point for them to look at. And now looking again at the case that in 2008, the case of Shafi, um, that was um, effectively brought because it was thought the police were trying to circumvent the criminal protections by uh, just starting civil injunctions and trying to circumvent that. So that case of Shafi held that a civil junction could not be made in circumstances where an ASBO was available. So there was still that degree of protection at that point that suggested that where there had been antisocial behavior, there was a requirement to prove to the criminal standard that the subject of the order had in fact acted uh, in that way. Um, now, as an apparent response to that case, uh, we were then given in 2009 by Gordon Brown's government, section 34, of the Policing and Crime Act. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this evening, um, because that is what guides um, our gang injunctions. Um, now, there's, this is still a two-stage test, um, as you can see, and I'm just gonna go through that because the first section is this. The first condition is that court, this is so annoying, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move, I've got part of my screen covering my slides and I can't see them. Right, let me move that. Um, so the first condition is that the court is satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the respondent has engaged in or has encouraged or assisted. Uh, why is that not working? Uh, gang related violence or gang related drug dealing activity. Now, you can obviously see, first of all, the government has explicitly removed the criminal standard there and made it on the balance of probabilities. They've also removed the requirement to have actually carried out an act. Um, so they can have engaged in or encouraged or assisted, and those can be very widely determined, gang-related violence or gang-related drug uh, dealing activity. Um, the second condition is that the court thinks it's necessary to, to grant the injunction for either or both of the following purposes. 
and that's either to prevent them from engaging in encouraging or assisting gang related violence or gang related drug dealing or to protect them from effectively the same. Now, on the face of it, um, even with the lower balance of probabilities and that the, um, con the conditions being expanded to include encouraging or assisting gang related violence or gang related drug dealing activities sound like quite serious crimes. And just going back to the question that that lady asked earlier, um, the, the difficulty is when you start coming down into what this actually means. Now, um, a gang is defined as, under subsection five, it has to consist of at least three people and it has one or more characteristics that enable its members to be identified by others as a group. And that's it. That is the definition of a gang. Now, just by way of an example um, of a gang under this definition, this is actually my mother's Thursday night singing group, rather naturally named Treble in Paradise. That is a group of more than three people who are easily identifiable as a group. That is a gang under the definition of this act. So just to show the absurdity of how wide that definition is. So really gang related, you can just read group related. Now looking again at gang related violence, and this is where the real danger comes in for drill music. Violence includes a threat of violence. And the reason that that is so significant for drill artists is because, of course, uh, lyrics um, and how those lyrics are perceived. Now, again, I'm conscious not to go through anything that we've already heard from previous speakers, but um, those of you who came to the first lecture will remember Dr. Ethna Quinn, who was the senior lecturer at Manchester University, talking about the evolution of lyrics and the common styles that are used in this kind of genre of music. And that includes speaking from a first person perspective, um, often retelling stories from a first person perspective, both real and fictional. Um, and of course, going on to then make threats um, of violence or warnings for people to stay away. And it's interesting, uh, if anyone would like to look at it, there's actually been a paper produced in January 2019 for the University of Missouri. And it looked at um, analyzing music lyrics from 400 top chart songs over that 10 year period. And that included all genres of music from rap, hip hop, pop, um, country music, etc. And it actually found that even though rap and hip hop had the highest levels of profanity, violence and misogyny, pop music had the same levels of violence included in their music lyrics. So these threats of violence um, are not unique to drill. They are across the board in music genres and it, and it's, um, it appears to be drill that's being targeted um, over others. Um, now, uh, that's what's quite important when looking at how the courts were approaching this because the key aim of a lot of drill artists is not always to start a war or to um, incite violence with a rival gang. It sometimes is but it's often also just to make money. This is a hugely popular area. And I just want to play a short clip from the Terms and Conditions music from somebody called Drill Minister, who is a drill artist and an advocate and campaigner in this area, who can explain a little more about that. Amy's just gonna play that. for the better. This music gives us an opportunity to make six figures, to stay in London, for us to not be sent to Wolverhampton, not be moved out by Universal Credit and all these things and austerity and all these things that they're putting on us. This gives us the opportunity to actually make a decent wage that a banker is making in central London. So the police don't like this. Police ain't making that money. You see what I'm trying to say? They don't want no problem. Um. Yes, again, I'll just come back to some of those clips, but there are, um, it's important to remember there's a real industry behind this. Um, the motivations for these kinds of violent lyrics are because they sell, um, they're popular, it's what people want to listen to. It's not necessarily intending to start any kind of gang, gang warfare. Um, so um, looking then at what the current provisions are under section 35, you can effectively find yourself in a position where a court can be provided with hearsay evidence, um, effectively of a law abiding individual who's encouraging someone in a music collective, it doesn't have to be done themselves, to threaten violence in their lyrics. Um, and if the court finds then on the balance of probability that that hearsay evidence is reliable, 
uh, that in individual can be made subject to a gang injunction. Um, and that's either because they consider it's necessary to protect them or because it's necessary to protect other people. So it's worth noting that definition is going to catch most uh, music producers, record label executives, lyricists, etc. They, they can fall uh, within that definition. So you can see that even the limited criminal safeguards of the old antisocial behaviour orders have effectively been completely circumvented and removed um, by these gang injunctions. Um, now that fact was challenged in the case of um, Jones, and that's the main case that I want to discuss with you. I'll just go back to the uh, slide for a moment. Right, so uh, this is the case um, of Jones, and it was an appeal um, against an interim gang injunction. It'd be made um, at, under Section 34, it'd also be made under Section 1, the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. And the background to this case was the conflict between the Johnson crew, um, the Burger Bar boys, and the Guns and Money gang, which you may have heard of. They're quite an infamous, um, all splinter gangs from the Inch One gang in Birmingham. Um, and they have got a well-known and long-running rivalry. But there are a number of conditions imposed on the appellants, which I won't go through all of, but number five is important. Number five prevented Jones from participating in any music video that he knew or ought to know, included any material that related to the Johnson crew, the Burger Bar gang, or any gang um, uh, affiliated to either of those gangs and that may have the effect of promoting, supporting, or assisting gang-related violence or drug dealing by such gangs. Now, again, I, I, I know that there's quite a lot in that, but it's uh, a music video that he knows or ought to know, includes material that relates to, again, a wide definition, relates to any of these gangs, and that that may have, not necessarily will have, but may have the effect of promoting or supporting or assisting gang-related, read group-related violence, read threats of violence. Now, there is so much in that um, that is open to um, a wide interpretation that it effectively becomes meaningless. It's just uh, being prevented from it being involved in any kind of music that's going to discuss gangs. Um, of course, these are uh, real gangs. Um, they are gangs that have been certainly involved, um, some of their members, in very serious crimes. Um, but certainly when it looks at the injunction, the, the, the people that are caught by this, um, in fact, it's, it's like a gagging order that no one can discuss what's going on around them. No one can discuss um, anything around their local area that affects them. Um, now, the appellants um, who were challenging um, this injunction and saying that it should have had the safeguards of Article 6 um, raised a couple of points. Firstly, they said um, that it was a... Uh, a, a, an injunction done in respect of a criminal charge and they argued that the proceedings were in respect of a criminal charge and therefore article 6 was engaged and secondly that the civil balance of probability standard of proof um, breached the usual safeguards and the court actually dismissed that appeal um, and that's because they uh, argued they said that there was first of all the issue of whether or not it was a criminal charge followed the three-stage test um, the first of that is is it a criminal matter in domestic law um, secondly, is the underlying offence criminal in nature? And finally, is the effect of the proceedings penal in nature? Um, so if those questions were all answered in the affirmative, or if one of them was answered in the affirmative, then uh, it would have the usual safeguards that Article 6 provides. That's the article right to a fair trial. Um, now, when it looked at the first issue, whether or not this is a matter of... Um, domestic law, they conceded it wasn't. Of course, we accept that these civil gang injunctions are not considered to be domestic law uh, in this country. But when Lord uh, Justice Levinson, who was delivering the judgment, um, looked at the second two, he effectively blended this, the two criteria together. And he said that the nature of the proceedings was not criminal. And the reason he said that was because, as I discussed earlier, you can have one of these orders made against somebody who hasn't actually done anything criminal. So because these injunctions can be imposed against someone who hasn't committed a criminal offence, that was argued in this case to be the reason why all of the criminal safeguards don't apply, uh, which is a, a fairly circular argument. Um, but 
Uh, effectively, you had counsel for the Secretary of State arguing that these orders can be made against individuals who'd done nothing wrong. And they gave examples of simply making fun of people online um, or going to their territory to rile up um, other gang members. Um, so the fact that they've legislated in that way actually circumvents the protections of Article 6. And then the final question for the court um, was whether or not this was um, a penal in nature. Um, and they found that they looked at the case of Gazzardi. Now, this was a case where a, suspect, a suspected mafioso boss uh, was subjected to an injunction and that detained him on an island. The Strasbourg court held that his detention was not penal by saying, on a true analysis, the order for Mr. Guzzardi's compulsory residence was not a punishment for a specific offence, but a preventative measure taken on the strength of indications of a propensity towards crime. So that was argued in the case of Jones, that the current position is that where the order is preventative rather than punitive, the proceedings can't be considered to be in respect of a criminal charge and therefore none of the Article 6 safeguards apply. So we've got a position where our usual protections have been completely circumvented. Um, you're having individuals who don't need to have committed any kind of crime uh, and who are then being subjected to an order that prevents them from making any music, discussing any of the um, gangs or people they know, or making any threats of violence that could be perceived um, or perceived to be as such by the police. So um, I just want to finish now because I'm conscious of not running into um, Cecilia's time, but just looking at the case of Skengo, Skendo and AM. Now, those are two very successful drill artists um, who were made the subject of uh, a drill injunction like this. And I'm very grateful to um, Daryl Ennis Gale from Hodge Jones and Allen, who represented those two artists for giving us his permission just to play a short clip explaining what happened in their case. So if I could just ask Amy to play that. My name is Daryl Ennis. I'm a solicitor and I represent um, the act known as Skengo and AM. Recently represented them in proceedings um, in the county court in relation to what are commonly known as drill injunctions. Can exit. Looks like he's uh, possibly done a tire. We are at golf. We have a six one. Bravo, golf. They had a song called Attempted 1.0, which had lyrics in it, which the police thought would incite local violence between rival groups in the area. It was my friend from here, my friend. Got fuck with them, niggas ain't real. Look, left you twice, twice. Times man got chef, run a man down, run a man down, what bed? Times man got quenched. They just came to my house and served me just like that. Brown envelope. I don't know what's in this brown envelope. They've knocked on the door, given it to me. Once you've taken it, you've been served, you've accepted it. There were a number of conditions attached to the interim injunction, um, but the specific um, motive for the injunction, the police would say, was to prevent gang-related activity. My big four, five, it came with fries. I keep her close, my valentine. Her range ain't shit, is kind of wide. So if you like, you're gonna die. So it didn't make no sense. We weren't allowed in certain postcodes, mention certain things in our songs, talk about certain people. The big sign finally made it, but I'm just happy to actually be here. And then there was a performance in December where the crew performed the song Attempted 1.0. And that was when the police brought the proceedings against them for breaching the order, so they were committal proceedings. The breaches in relation to the song attempted being performed were found against the, the boys and they were um, issued with suspended sentence orders. And that lasts for two years, so it expires in 2021. So from then, from now till then, it's a whole lot of things that we can't do, can't say. We have to walk on a very, very thin ice. From a place. Okay, so that's uh, really all I wanted to say. I hope that's given an overview of these uh, civil gang injunctions and. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Cecilia Goodwin, I think is going to be able to give you a much clearer picture about the actual effects of these uh, orders once they've been made and the difficulties that people are having um, under those conditions. But thank you very much. And thank you also to uh, the, the producers of the Terms and Conditions documentary for letting us use those clips. Thank, thank you, um, Abigail. That, that um, really informative. And again, um, 
you know, quite scary just looking at how both the criminal law and civil law is being used to what I would say to really be an instrument of oppression. Anyway, look, our next speaker I'm really looking forward to, um, Cecilia Goodwin, Solicitor Advocate at Stevenson Solicitors. Cecilia is a, um, a solicitor with extensive experience in representing individuals charged with serious crimes and complex fraud. Uh, having qualified in 2008 when she, she has established a strong client base of individuals from all walks of life due to her personable approach, dedication and tenacity. She also specialises in representing those under investigation um, with the Department of Work and Pensions, Serious Fraud Office and um, H and um, Revenue and Customs. She undertakes immigration work and, ass and assists those who wish to enter uh, and remain in the UK. She's involved with numerous charitable organisations and is currently a trustee of the Stop and Search Legal Project. Cecilia, welcome. Please tell us a little bit about what you are going to be speaking about. Thank you so much, and thanks for, to all the panel members. It's been fantastic listening to you and hearing um, what you've kind of taken us through. So um, in essence, I um, have been working with a few people who are um, unfortunately find themselves the subjects of CBOs. Um, and so it's been an interesting um, couple of years, really. I think in the last two years, it's, it's kind of picked up in that area of law for me. Um, but if somebody had said to me, um, you know, even three years ago, as part of your day job, you're going to be interpreting drill lyrics. I would have just laughed because it just sounds so ridiculous. But unfortunately, that is kind of part of what my day job now entails. Um, I now, because of CBOs and because of some of my clients who are the subjects of CBOs, I'm having to interpret um, their drill lyrics in order to keep them on the right side of the CBO and to make sure that they don't end up breaching. So basically my um, talk to you today is just going to be about the practical things and just my experiences in dealing with people and representing individuals who are the subjects of CBOs. Um, so I'm not going to repeat much of what has been said already, but in essence, um, CBOs, as you've heard, are orders that basically have different conditions to them. And the most um, sort of well-used conditions tend to be things like non-association, geographical restrictions, that sort of thing. But then there are the sort of um, conditions that I call the nasty conditions, because they're the ones that get to the crux of the whole drill industry and the ability for an artist to be creative and to put music out um, and also make money. So one of those um, sort of conditions, I'll read one, which is just a, a broad example of what one of my clients um, is actually facing. So it says, must not, so the defendant must not, in relation to all material posted on any social media platforms, music videos and live performances where the public have access upon payment or otherwise. A, incite or encourage violence against any individual, group or gang by claiming responsibility for or threatening to commit any acts of violence against any individual, gang or group. B, make reference to particular events. C, make reference to postcodes or areas. D, make reference to any pseudonym or street names. E, make reference to any individuals or gang members. So that's quite broad, that in terms of a condition, because there's so much that you can unpack in there, but unfortunately so much that you can get caught out in, if especially you are, in my um, situation with one of my, my clients, a signed artist. So that brings me into how I ended up having to start interpreting drill lyrics. Um, like most people, maybe most people on this platform today, I could barely, when I started, just about understand the first sentence of what was being said. I mean, you can pick up words here or there and think, okay, shank, that might mean this, or splash, that might mean this, but 
in terms of actually sitting down and listening to a full drill uh, piece is actually quite hard work. But that's where I found myself having to interpret lyrics to make sure that they're not breaching the CBO because obviously breaches will end up with either if the song is published being taken down by the police and secondly which is more serious and is you know the stinger in this it becomes a criminal offense there's an arrest that follows for breach of the CBO and it's in the criminal courts and there you are you find yourself um, in the dock for breach of a CBO so it's really important obviously as far as my client is concerned to make sure that he doesn't breach but he's also got to make sure that he makes money, that he delivers to his fan base, and that he stays true to the essence of what drill music is, which, like all music, is storytelling. And a lot of it is storytelling of his experiences or experiences of people that he knows, um, or in other instances, where somebody has mentioned that sometimes they're made up scenarios but either way they can't breach any of these terms of these orders so what happens in terms of my day-to-day -day then when a client well when my client comes to me with a new song first of all i've got to then go through the lyrics with him not just him but also with management so I found with this experience that having a good management company and a record label that are behind the artist and are supportive and understand, you know, kind of the perils of, you know, the, the situation has been really helpful because then you can have really frank conversations with the artist, with management in terms of things that could be breaches. So in relation to the lyrics, we have a situation where we go through them together, as well as with management. And once we have gone through all the lyrics and I'm of the view that there's nothing in there that could be taken to incite or encourage violence, even though it's drill music and by nature that's what drill is, we then serve them on the police. Once we serve them on the police, um, they do nothing with them. So it's not a situation in which they would say, okay, that's fine, thank you. Actually, can you take this lyric out or can, can you change this or what does this mean? We're in a situation where we have to give them the lyrics, but they don't do anything with them. It goes into a bank and they sit and they wait. The next step in the stage is the video. So we now need to put out a video and we now need to obviously hire out places in terms of where the video is going to take place and who is going to be in the video. And a lot of these artists have got non-association, as I explained before, um, conditions. So with a lot of drill music, as you've seen, you'll have somebody obviously spitting lyrics, but they will be in a group of people. And a lot of these CBOs say they can't be with those people. So how do you get them to be present at your shoot for your video when you want them in that shoot and they want to be in the shoot? That's where we have the further notification requirements because I then have to contact the police, having got instructions from my client, say who he wants to be in the video. I then have to contact the police to say, well, these named individuals need to be in the um, video and we're giving you notice that we'd like them in the video. The next question is, well, is it going to be in a public place or is it going to be in private? Because in the CBO, the known association clauses tend to bite when they're, you're, in, you're associating with certain individuals in public. But if you associate them with them in a private place, then you're not in breach. So the next thing is trying to work out where the shoot is going to take place, whether it's in a public or private. And if it's a public place, then what's really important is that when everyone attends the venue to record the song, they can't travel together. 
So you then, in the background with management and everybody have to then start working out logistics. Who's gonna arrive at what time, when, how? Because if they are found together, even on the doorstep, if it's obviously uh, public, it's a breach and it's a simple arrest. So I then end up having to contact um, the venues to try and work out is it public, public or private if that is not um, you know, obvious. Um, and then once I've done that, then contact all of the people who are supposed to be in the music video. Now, all of the people that are meant to be in the music videos are not necessarily without their own issues. You've guessed it, they also are subjects of criminal behavior orders. And they also have notif notification requirements on their CBOs. So what then happens is I then have to notify on their behalf to the police that they want to appear in a music video with my client, for example. I then have to notify the police on behalf of my client that he wants to appear with the others. Otherwise, again, it's a breach and an arrest. The notification extends to the time, place, date, and as we've just discussed, who is going to actually be there. The notification requirement also wants you to specify the production team or the company. But the best part of it is, after doing all of that, the police can turn up at the actual shoot at any time and they have to be given access. So it's a situation in which even when you are working and you're trying to make money, you still have you know, the state in essence policing everything that you're doing. And a lot of these um, conditions, I would say, probably are there to catch you out because a lot of the time, unfortunately, unless you have somebody in the background saying, okay, has this been done? Has that been done? Ticking off boxes, you'll find yourself, unfortunately, in a position in which you have breached. And the next thing you know, you're um, sitting in a dock, um, having to enter a plea. The notification of all of this as well, must all be done in writing 48 hours before the shoot. So if you have a situation, which I've had before, where um, the venue had to change at the last minute and we only had 24 hours, I found myself having to obviously speak to the police and, and, and so forth to try and say, look, this is the position, this is what's happening, is there anything we can do in the middle? And that dialogue is important because without that, then if they don't, if they went to the second venue, the police didn't know, most of the people there would have been arrested and have been uh, found themselves um, before the criminal courts. Once that's done, so we're in a position where we've given our lyrics, our lyrics are fine, they've been checked we're okay. We've now um, created this wonderful music video. Everybody's happy. We're now waiting for the production or the, the music video to be dropped, for example, and everybody's really excited. There's one other thing that has to come, and that is once the music video goes out, you're required to notify the police again that this music video has gone out. Yes, the same music video that they have been aware of throughout, you now have to inform them that it's now dropped and where it's being uploaded, who the production company are, et cetera, et cetera. So with this, there comes a lot of um, stress in terms of the young person, because um, they tend to be quite young, um, who is trying to make a life for themselves, trying to make money, trying to change their lives around because they constantly have that threat of a potential breach 
which can lead to return to custody. But then you also have the other um, factors, which are the management company who work with that young person. They have to be willing and they have to be patient with the process and to assist to try and make sure that things are done correctly before putting money first, which, you know, is difficult. You've got the record label who have this person that they have paid all of this money for. Cecilia, I don't know if it's me, but I think we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Did I? Yeah, did you're, I back. Hear you're, you're back now. Oh, so sorry. I was saying, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so I was saying, um, in relation to this young person um, who is an artist, who was a signed artist, for them to be able to make strides to change their lives, they have so many hurdles to go through and even just being able to put a song out can land you back in prison and what you're trying to do is avoid going back to prison so it, it's a little bit like you know a revolving door or a setup in a way but I had this um this situation where um we had gone through all of the steps that needed to be done you know the lyrics had been done the music video and everything and it was a day of the release of the song. And so I was pretty, you know, happy, confident. I just thought, great, I've done my job. Now his song can go out and this is brilliant because obviously we'd been working on this for months and months and months. So when um, the next day came, obviously looking forward to it, I then get a call from his manager and he says, um, Celia, are we, um, supposed to noti have notified them 24 hours before the song comes out. So I said, mm, I don't think so. I don't remember that condition because by now I've got the condition stuck in my head. And he said, I don't know. I think I read something, something about 24 hours. So panic stations, go off and look at this CBO. But obviously at that stage, I'm a bit panicked. I'm not, I'm just trying to read it to think, oh my God, today's the day I, I haven't got 24 hours. And I see this condition which says notify uh, of upload 24 hours. The blood drained out of my body that day. I thought, oh my God, oh my God. And I just thought, he has, he's got this song coming out and unfortunately, um, I might have missed something out. So I go back to my to his manager and say, look, um, having looked at this, if, if we needed a bit more time, for example, I mean, you know, could, could, could we release the song tomorrow? You know, would that be okay? No, the song has to be released today. Okay, um, no problem, I'll come back to you. Phone a friend, fuck, I think I've messed up. This song is dropping today. I haven't got 24 hours. I think I was supposed to notify them. and. I just started thinking to myself, I now have to have this conversation with my client to say, um, so you know you've got this song that's coming out today and we've all been working hard towards it, but um, you might get arrested <laughs> if, you, if this song comes out today. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, it's been fun being a lawyer. I mean, I've had, I've had fun, you know, everything, every, all good things come to an end. And yeah, so I thought, okay, great. I'm in a situation where I think I was supposed to notify within 24 hours. Uh, sorry, notify it before 24 hours before it goes up. So my client is there. He's having kind of a pre-party for the release. Um, and then I go back and look at the term again, just before I, I have this awkward conversation. And I've never fallen in love with the word so much in my life. And that word was within. It said, must notify the police within 24 hours of upload and give details of where uh, and when it will be uploaded. So 
I was saved. <laughs> I phoned back the um, the manager and I said, we're okay, we're okay, the word is within, within, within. And all of this was happening in the background. And my client was completely oblivious, you know, looking forward and counting down to his thing. So it's, um, it's one of those things that, that obviously happens. And those are the problems with dealing and representing, obviously, um, people, drill artists, because there are so many, so many loopholes, so many things that you have to jump through, so many hurdles, and it is difficult. Um, but I can't say, you know, I've not been enjoying it. I've been learning a lot. And I'm pleased to say I know a little bit more about drill now. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank, no, so yeah. thank you. Um, and that's me finishing up. I think I've run out of time. So sorry <laughs> about that. Cecilia, no, um, thank you for that. that really insightful. I, I, I know that we um, are finishing soon, but there are some really great questions that I want to put to some of our panelists. So can I start with you, um, Cecilia? There's a question. Hi, Cecilia. You mentioned before that when you give the lyrics to the police, nothing happens. I thought the police would either agree or disagree with your evaluation. How then can an artist rap the lyrics or even play the song when, when um, shooting the video? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So um, before I started um, working with this particular artist, there was, I, I, I think Danielle mentioned it in terms of um, a supervising officer. There has to be a supervising officer. And what had happened in the past was um, he would give the lyrics to the supervising officer, the supervising officer would come back and say, yay yeah, or nay. And that to me seemed fantastic. And that's what I wanted for, for, to carry on. But unfortunately the police decided that actually um, we don't want to be in a position where we are giving advice on lyrics. Because obviously part of what they want to do is arrest for a breach. So if they're now going to be giving somebody advice as to whether or not they can put the song out, it then makes it difficult yeah. for them. So in essence, we're now in a situation where the police have point blank said to me, because we, we had discussions back and forth that they will not assist and they will not give advice. So all we can do is just provide the lyrics um, and we wait. Okay. Mm. Can I, can I, can I, I want to get in a couple more questions. Uh, a lot of the questions are addressed to you, Celia. Um, uh, how easy have you found it to get supportive expert evidence to challenge the prosecution's version of lyrics and the meaning or suggested meaning behind the lyrics? Do you agree it's now time to have some sort of register of experts? I absolutely agree. And that's one of the things that I have been working on, which is, um, I've spoken to a few experts um, who, you know, specialize in drill language and so forth, because what happens is if somebody, as I'm sure a lot of you know, if someone is arrested um, and they're facing a breach of um, CBO at court, the police are going to have their own department of experts, they call experts, drill experts, um, who will come to court and say, these lyrics say this. So one of the things that I've been considering is obviously having those drill, those actual lyrics looked at by an expert as well so that if i'm in a position where i have to defend somebody in court then at least i have expert evidence there are more people now actually who are stepping forward and are saying actually we'd be willing to do this um right, but yeah it's difficult can, can, can i can i throw this one out to um uh, adam please adam has there been any research done into the increase amounts of CBO orders being taken out by other agencies over and above the police or CPS in regular prosecutions that you know of? Do you know of any sort of like academic research? Um, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm not able okay. to answer that question. What, 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 that, yeah. what about um, Danielle or Abigail? Do you know of any research in, in, as part of your, when you're um, putting together a defence? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, the only thing I would say is that um, criminal behaviour orders will will usually be dealt with by the police, um, particularly looking at a, um, a criminal sentence. So I don't know about other agencies, but I, I, I'm not aware of any research. That's not to say there isn't any, but I haven't come across any yet. All right. Um, let me just see. Um, 
Uh, somebody's written, um, I've been, I'm really empowered by these sessions. Thank you for highlighting the fact that discrimination is being challenged. However, a local youth court is filled with duty solicitors with little youth knowledge, creating an environment where CBOs are really challenged. Is that something that um, some of our practitioners have found? Um, Abigail, um, Danielle, Cecilia, do, do, you, do you find that you know, these CBOs are not really challenging the way that they should be? Yeah. I, I think, sorry, Danielle. Well, no, well, I, I was just gonna say, I think that part of the problem is that the legislation is so, the threshold so low in the legislation. So as I said, when I, when I did my talk, you, you know, in almost every single uh, offence, the, the statutory provisions are going to apply to, to your defendant. So it, it is quite difficult. So I think that challenges that are going to be mounted should possibly be mounted against the legislation itself, because it's that watering down that has really led to us um, being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do you find that um, practitioners are prepared to have a fight? Um, you know, you know, maybe maybe some public law administrative challenges need to be taken. I mean, it, it really depends on the practitioner. I mean, obviously, if they're from Garden Court, there won't be a problem. Um, but I, I genuinely have found that there's quite a lot um, of people who will simply just sign off on these because they're concentrating on the main criminal sentence right. and the ancillary orders dealt with often when the courts don't have much time. They've already dealt with the main sentence and people just want to move on. And I have seen when I'm observing other cases that these are just being, um, you know, rubber stamped, basically. All right. Can I, can I do, do one more question? Um, thanks, Celia. Really informative. The steps an artist has to make before making a music video or going on tour are so onerous as to having a chilling effect on their freedom of expression. Has any thought been given to challenging the impositions of these orders under the Human Rights Act or some other route? So yeah, thank you for the question. And absolutely, you're, you're spot on. I think it is a real infringement on human rights. And this is something that I am looking into um, on behalf of um, certainly this artist and others I've been looking after as well, because, you know, in terms of putting out content as an artist, you're putting out your art form, your creativity. And it's just not right that the police, the state, or somebody like myself should be in the forefront of that saying to an artist, you can't say this, let's mm -hmm. remove this. This is not, who am I to say that? I'm not a drill artist, I'm not, I, I barely understand drill music. It, well, I've had to learn about it, but it, it's not a genre that I, I really was, you know, really aware of. So why should it be somebody like me that has, you know, should be coming along and saying, you can't say this. You know, it, it, it really is a curtailment on people's um, freedom of expression. So, yeah. Some, some, somebody makes the point, uh, it was said that Article 10 of the ECHR, U European Convention of Human Rights, has not yet been applied to these types of cases. Has Article 14 as a discriminatory, possibly systemic state policy against a particular group? Obviously, Article you, you can't invoke Article 14 on its own. It has to be invoked in conjunction with um, um, another one of the convention rights, but is that something that people are thinking about? Yeah, definitely. Because I think what I would really like to do uh, next, you know, following months or years, whatever it is, is to look at the data and to try and understand and see who, what kind of people are being given these CBOs and yeah. for what? Because once we have that data, and that understanding, then something like Article 14 is something that, you know, it will speak for itself, yeah. you know, because if, 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 the, if the numbers say this, then, you know, it, you know it, it's, it's there. Yeah. All right, look, um, to all our speakers, um, you know, Adam, Danielle, Abigail, Cecilia, thank you so much for giving us such an informative talk I really have learned something. And it, uh, you know what? It's scary, really, really scary a, a, about how people can be criminalized so easily um, just basically for making music. 
anyway, um, you know, uh, a big hand, a big virtual hand to all of, to, to all of our speakers. Thank you very much.